So with that, I want to introduce Eric Cooley. Eric is a researcher with the UW Discovery Farms program, started out as a researcher, is now the co-director of that program. Discovery Farms is a program here in Wisconsin that focuses on on-farm research on real farms, looking at the environmental impacts of agricultural operations. So with that, Eric, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone, and I uh, appreciate you having me on today. Um, I want to start off with just a couple of slides for those of you that have not maybe heard of the Discovery Farms program to tell you a little bit about our program and about where some of the data that I'm going to be talking about today comes from. So the Discovery Farms are actual real-life farms in uh, different areas of the state that are really facing um, a real diversity in challenges, not only from the physical setting that they reside in, but also the, the vast difference in farming systems that we have here in Wisconsin. So the goal of our program is really to, to take a look at the uh, nutrients and sediment that are leaving these different uh, agricultural landscapes and really try to correlate that to both management, the physical setting, and some of the um, tillage and cropping practices that are being used by those individual farms. Uh, when we go and we do some of the research on, on, a, uh, on a discovery farm, we, we shoot for about a five to seven year total program length. The first two to three years is we monitor and try to get a baseline of um, the magnitude and the timing of the losses that are occurring from that landscape. And then after that period, we sit down with the farmer and see if there are some practices that we can try to implement to mitigate some of those losses. And then we use the remaining three to four years to see if we can show a, an environmental benefit from uh, some of the practices that we've, that we've tried implementing. So one of the things uh, that I think is, has been a huge success of our program is that we are a farmer-led program. We are guided by a steering committee that is made up of representation from a, um, many of the major agricultural commodity groups here in Wisconsin, and we also have uh, representation from some of the environmental groups as well uh, that we have here. And they really help us to identify the research needs and help us to prioritize those needs so that we can do the, the research that's needed. We also utilize our farmers and our steering committee uh, for the research design and implementation. But the last two things that we use uh, our farmers for are really is kind of the key, again, for the success of this program, is that we really work collaboratively with the farmers to, um, to discuss why we're seeing some of the losses that we're observing from, from the different farming operations and really try to uh, collectively come up with some some new approaches and kind of some out-of-the-box thinking with ways that we can try to reduce some of those losses. But um, the final aspect is we use our farmers to do a lot of the education in field days and seminars that we put on. And it, it really has a lot more credibility when we have a farmer that gives the information uh, rather than any of our staff. So uh, again, we see a big benefit uh, from utilizing farmers in, in all aspects of our program. So what do we measure? We measure both the quantity and the quality of, of uh, water that is leaving different agricultural settings. And here on that upper picture, we've got a combined surface water and, and tile that we're monitoring from a, a given basin. And if you uh, I'll blow up, we've got a wing wall that goes across and forces all the water through this surface water flume. And if we know the depth of water in that flume, we can very accurately calculate the volume. And similarly, if you were to open the top of this five-foot culvert, we've got another type of flume that uh, we've got in line with the tile system. And not only do we do the, the surface edge of field and tile monitoring, but we also do some uh, stream monitoring as well. The other aspect of our program that I really think um, is we didn't have a very strong knowledge base before some of the research that we did is we monitor 365 days a year. I have to admit, being a field technician for many years doing the research, it is miserable work. Uh, it's very time consuming, expensive, and uh, but if, it's really when we're seeing a lot of the losses and runoff occurring from the landscape, which I'll show you in just a few slides. But, as you can see in the upper left-hand slide, there's actually, right where the pointer is, there's a flume underneath that snow, and when it comes time for snow melt, 
we have to hand dig that all the way out in order to make sure that we get accurate uh, readings from this. The other fun thing that happens is that um, when we do get into snow melt conditions, we can see that those that the water will flow during the daytime and freeze at night. So we spend uh, the late late part of the day collecting samples, and we spend most of the night and early mornings trying to get the ice back out of these plumes for flow the next day. So it's miserable but important work, and uh, we're pl we're proud to have to uh, provide um, water quality data throughout the year. So for the the uh, data that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm really going to be focusing on a lot of the edge of field information. Right now we've got about 175 site years of, of data that we have available. But we, from our core farms, we've got about 68 years of edge of field data. And then within our watersheds, we've got about another 40 years of site years of uh, edge of field monitoring. So um, a lot of the slides that, that I'm going to be showing you today are going to be about 100 years of data that we've culminated to make. Uh, the information that I'm providing you today. So quickly to just cover some of the frozen ground periods that we've seen, uh, this data goes back as far as 2003 when we started doing some of the monitoring. We define frozen ground we've got as uh, being uh, continuously frozen at a depth of either 1, 2, 8, uh, 16, or 32 inches. And we can see that that typically happens uh, near the beginning of November and typically thaws out near the end of March. But we've seen the earliest time uh, be the, the 11th of this month. I think we're going to set a new record this year. Um, and thaws uh, we've seen as early as the middle of March. And we've also seen some of the latest freeze ups at the end, or excuse me, at the beginning of January uh, and the latest at the uh, mid-April. So those typically we're seeing freeze up begin around the 1st of December and then near the end of March. So this really shows if we break down the runoff by month, it shows the, uh, the mean runoff that we, the average runoff that we're getting per month. Um, the, if we take and divide all that runoff and put it in one pot, how much of that, the second column is how much of that occurs during a given month the frequency that we see runoff events in a given month, the average precipitation, and the amount of runoff um, as compared to precipitation. So you'll see that, that our timing of a field year starts in October, and October is typically the time that we see field activities begin to change for that next year's crop. So a lot of those uh, fall either manure or fertilizer applications will often occur in October or after for the subsequent year's crops. So that's why we begin our field year in October. So the first thing that I want to, a uh, period that I want to point out to you is that frozen ground period. If we look at the total runoff that occurs uh, throughout the year, 58% of it occurs in that December through March time period. The next big runoff period that we see is coming out of snow melt and those early spring rains when those soils are still pretty high in, soil, in moisture content, we're seeing an additional 30% uh, of all the runoff occurring in March through June. Today we're going to be concentrating um, on that December through uh, March time period. And not only does 58% occur during this time period, but if we just look at the month of February and March, those two months combined account for over half, or 53%, of all the runoff that we typically see uh, during the frozen ground period. The other interesting fact that uh, just until recent years I wanted to show is that in the month of March, during the, the typical snow melt period, we have seen edge of field runoff at every site every year that we've monitored. Up until just recently, we, we monitored a site with uh, some sandy soil that was relatively low slope. And that, believe it or not, did still run off during many years, but we did have a few years where uh, that, that very sandy low slope site did not run off. But typically, we see runoff occur at every site uh, that we monitor every year in March. So again, it's a time where um, we we're almost guaranteed to see, to see runoff occur. So when we, when we get into the frozen ground period, we've really seen that there are three factors that correlate strongly with an increased potential for nutrient loss if manure applications are made on frozen ground. 
believe it or not, it's not just the frozen ground. Um, we've seen applications made early during the frozen ground period that have had relatively low losses that, that have occurred from subsequent runoff events. But if either of the, the three following things occur, we typically see uh, much elevated uh, potential for loss. The first one is concrete frost. And that diagram on the right-hand side really shows um, how, that, how that forms. So when we get into a situation now where we've initially got that frost layer established in the soil, the pore space, um, and I'm going to turn on my pointer again here, the pore space really looks like this unsaturated frost that we have, and that goes all the way to the surface of the soil. But when we get some, some thaw events, um, we will see that the uh, um, that upper soil profile will get saturated, but it won't push all the way through the soil profile, and it'll actually freeze in the upper portion. And that, um, so we'll, we will get the surface sealing of, of that soil, and thus, if we have a manure application, there is no pore space for that, uh, the additional juices to get into that soil, so they have a much higher potential for loss. Similarly, ice crusting of the soil is where we get rain on frozen ground, and we actually will get um, we've seen upwards of three quarters to an inch of ice that has covered the soil. Again, if we have manure applications on top of that, has a very high potential for loss. And then finally, if we have a denser, deep snowpack, the um, the amount of water in that that causes separation between the applied manure and the the soil surface. The the more snowpack or the the denser that snowpack is, again, it's like roller bearings between that applied manure and the soil surface. So. If any of these three conditions are existing during the frozen ground period, we see much elevated uh, potential for loss. So finally, I'm going to show you some data to, to highlight um, some of the information that we've learned by these, by these conditions. And this is going to be a graph of a uh, farm where we had three really nicely paired basins. We had uh, basin R1, R2, and R3, which are all edge of field surface water basins that had very similar cropping systems. It was a no-till strip crop um, situation, and that's one of the reasons that you'll see kind of the multiple time periods of uh, manure applications on the, uh, the left-hand side. But it really allowed us to do some comparison between basins based on the timing of the application of uh, manure. So we're first going to look at field year 2004. In basins R1, and R2, we had liquid manure that were applied during February. In R3, we did not have that February manure application. And although the rates were very similar between basins, the timing of those two February applications, we see much elevated losses in R1 and R2 as compared to R3 with those liquid manure applications. It's not just the solid manure, it's, it's not just liquid manure, it's the solid manure. And we can see that in Basin R3, we had a January, uh, applications made in January and February of solid manure, and those were higher than the other two basins. And finally, um, in, in field year 2009, we had solid manure applied in February in, in R1, and solid manure in January and February. In R3, and again, we can see the elevated um, losses during those time periods. And again, that had to do with the development of those three conditions, either the, the concrete frost, the ice crusting, or the deep and dense snowpack. So these really do have an impact on the timing of these really do have an impact on the losses. And the, the one thing I wanted to show, those were all for phosphorus. I also want to show you the nitrogen uh, losses during those same time period. This is a graph, similar graph of nitrogen losses. I'm going to cycle back through these one more time. Here's phosphorus, and here's nitrogen. So again, it's very strongly correlated and tied to those uh, manure applications during during the uh, those January and February months. The last thing I really wanted to talk about was um, some of the speciation of nitrogen loss that we saw, and this was in some tidal drainage research. And I apologize, there's a lot of information to show on this graph, so I'm going to blow it up. But on the top here, this shows you the, these red bars going down are the, the applied nitrogen, and this is, the lines are the, 
light blue is the total nitrogen, uh, dark blue is nitrate, uh, the pink is ammonium, and yellow is, is organic. So we've got two years of back-to-back -back corn silage. We're going to concentrate on the first year here, where we can see that two applications of, of very low nutrient content, sand manure was applied, and we can see that the, um, uh, that the, it's predominantly lost in the ammonium form. Uh, because during the wintertime months, when the ammonium form that's commonly in manure will reside that way because the microbial activity is not there to convert both it and the uh, organic into the nitrate form. If we look at the following year, we can see that uh, liquid manure was injected right after corn silage was taken off, but because we had a warm, wet fall, all of the ammonium and organic nitrogen rapidly converted to nitrate, and that was the predominant form that was lost. And the thing that, the reason that this is so important is those, those fish that, uh, that get killed um, is a result of the ammonium losses that, uh, that can get into water bodies. And they're even, fish are killed by the ammonium, and they're also less tolerant during those wintertime months. So I know I've covered a lot of information today. Um, in summary, the frozen ground really can contribute the majority of the surface water runoff losses as well as the nutrient losses. The on-farm management is critical during these time periods to uh, mitigate losses not only for solid manure but also for liquid. We really need to observe the frozen ground conditions for the development of either concrete frost, ice pressing, or the deep dense snowpack, which will cause some um, increased potential for loss. And if we do have any of those and have to get out on those fields to still spread manure, we should really try to target low slope land that's far away from water bodies or uh, karst features in, in those landscapes. Finally, um, we've got a bunch of information on our website. If you go to our website on the home page and click on our research, scroll down to manure management, you'll see that we've got a tab just for frozen ground management of manure. So um, a lot of the information I covered today is, is in a variety of fact sheets there. And if you ever have any additional questions, um, you can also find my contact information on our website as well.